All right, uh, so we're back from our short break. And up next, we have uh, Professor Karen Chan. Um, she's an associate professor from Technical University of Denmark uh, in the physics department. And she's going to be talking to us about uh, surface charge densities and what that's going to mean for all the energetics of electrochemical reactions. So, Karen, it's all yours. Hey, thank you, Omar. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. All right. So first of all, thank you, Omar, Zach, and um, John for organizing this uh, virtual symposium. Um, it's great that we can still share um, given all the restrictions we have on um, travel. Um, and so as Omar said, I'll be talking primarily about surface charge density as opposed to the work function as the appropriate descriptor of the driving force for electrochemical reactions, what this means about how we calculate barriers, and just a peek at what it means for electrochemical CO2 reduction. Um, and so before I get started, I want to acknowledge the people who did all the work. Um, and so shown in the pictures here um, are the first authors or the co-first authors of the work. Um, and so Joe Gautier did the methods to model electrochemical barriers. Stefan Renge worked on electrochemical reduction of CO2 on gold, as well as ion effects. Um, Sudar Shan here is working on single atom catalysts. Uh, Carlos used to be a part of Tom Harneal and Chris Hahn's group, and he worked on electrochemical CO2 reduction on gold. And Ezra, who used to be in Alex Bell's group, um, did the experiments of ion effects in the electrochemical CO2 reduction. Um, so I also would like to thank the co-authors um, of the work that are shown here, who also contributed as well as the guys who drove a lot of the efforts behind um, the works that I'm going to show. Um, so I want to first start with the model system that we would like to understand. Um, the electrochemical interface, as we know, is rather complex. Um, there is always the presence of a solvent, which can have increasing ordering as we approach the interface. Um, at the surface, there are adsorbates and the reaction intermediates that we are interested in. Uh, there is a charge separation where the countercharge is distributed um, in solution in various ways, and this charge separation sets up the potential and field at the interface, which drives the processes that we are interested in. Um, and finally, the resultant kinetics um, are often coupled to mass transport processes, which uh, convolutes the activity response to an applied potential. Um, and so when we're talking about the driving force for electrochemical reaction, I want to start out with um, a perhaps simple and classical view of the potential drop at the interface, where we have here um, a rather linear drop across a compact layer um, and a diffuse layer corresponding to the distributed ions in solution. Um, and when we are talking about the applied electrode potential, we are generally talking about the metal potential relative to some bulk solution potential, as we can see here. Okay. Um, it's also possible in experiments to report it relative to a reference electrode, um, but that's essentially equivalent because there is basically a constant offset between the bulk solution potential and the reference potential. But when it comes to what's really driving our electrochemical reactions, it's really this local potential drop, as illustrated here, that is relevant. Okay? Um, and so the metal potential relative to some potential at the reaction plane. And this is not uniquely determined by the applied electrode potential, because one can envision with perhaps a different ion concentration, we can have a different driving force, as, I'm sh uh, as I've shown here. Um, and so this really is the idea behind the Frumkin correction to bottler volmer kinetics, which is decades old. Um, and this local potential shown here is basically proportional to the interfacial electric field, which then through Gauss's law is related to the surface charge density. And what I will suggest here is that this is a more appropriate descriptor of the driving force in electrochemical reactions. It influences how we calculate electrochemical barriers, and it also presents some opportunities for catalyst design. Okay, so then starting out with barriers then. Um, 
So when it comes to calculating electrochemical barriers and really any process where there is a dipole change along the reaction pathway, one of the major challenges in the field is how we can determine the effects under a constant drawing force. Because a simple explicit or fully explicit solvent simulation, we are looking at a constant number of electrons, whereas in experiments, we are operating under constant potential. Um, and this challenge here is illustrated by um, the simulation of a Hayrovsky reaction, which is a proton electron transfer to an adsorbed hydrogen. And what these charge density isosurfaces show us is that there's a significant shift in force along the pathway. Um, this we can also see in the work function um, corresponding to this, where for this very typical simulation, we get change of two to three volts along the reaction pathway. Um, and this is well beyond the potential range of any process that we would be interested in. Um, and so in the past decade or so, there's been a number of mitigation strategies that have, um, and I'll go over them briefly here. Um, one of them, I'll call this cell extrapolation. And what this is, is, um, at larger cells, the uh, change in charge density along the reaction pathway is significant, significantly smaller. Um, and so the idea then would be to do the calculation in a series of larger and larger unit cells until we can extrapolate to the infinite cell size limit, where then the potential is um, constant along the reaction pathway. Um, and so this is computationally quite heavy. Um, and an alternative to this, and I'll call this the charge extrapolation scheme, whereby relying on a capacitor model of the interface, if we can partition the charge at the interface, we can relate the small cell size result to the um, infinite cell size limit. Um, the issue here is that we face some challenges with charge partitioning for certain reactions, and so this isn't completely general either. Um, one alternative that has um, been increasingly popular in the past few years has been the use of implicit electrolytes. Um, and how it works is upon um, a reaction process that leads to a significant shift in dipole, for instance, CO2 adsorption, uh, one simultaneously applies um, a continuum charge, um, for instance, like so. so such that the driving force for the reaction remains constant along the reaction pathway. And there's a number of different ways to apply a continuum electrolyte. One of them is a linearized Poisson Boltzmann approach. And just as an example here, this is a corresponding um, charge density isosurface associated with that. Um, and so because of the multitude of possibilities in how we change the driving force at the electrochemical interface, my group in the past um, year or two have looked at developing a sort of general framework for us to determine reaction barriers from both implicit and explicit electrolyte models. Um, and this model considers the various possible charging elements at the interface, whether it's an explicit charge like this, um, charge coming from co-adsorbates or charge coming from continuum approximation, and there's a number of different ways we can do this. Um, we consider each of them to have their own capacitance, and so it sees the interface as a combination of different capacitances corresponding to all these different elements. And a critical aspect of this approach um, is going back to the title of this talk that it's the effective surface charge and not the work function, which is the more appropriate description scripture of the driving force for activity. Um, and this idea is uh, best illustrated with an example. Okay, and so let us consider the Vollmer reaction as an example here. Um, and so this is basically a proton electron transfer to the surface to form adsorbed hydrogen. Um, and in the case that we are working only with explicit electrolytes, the only way that we can change the driving force for this process is to change the ion concentration. Um, and practically what it means is it means doing our calculations in different cell sizes. And so shown here is um, exactly what we have done. This is the Volmer reaction energy as a function of work function calculated at different ion concentrations using fully explicit 
it's a solvent. Um, it's also possible to change the driving force here by adding some implicit charge, for instance, using a linearized Poisson-Boltzmann model, um, like so, for instance. And so what we find is that when we do that, um, we essentially get time-valued functions um, for the energy as a function of work function, depending on the cell size in our simulations. And so in this case, the work function does not uniquely determine the energetics when there's multiple charging components with different capacitances. And what this also suggests is that some existing results could also be different if they were redone in significantly different cell sizes. Um, and this really makes sense going back to this kind of Frumpkin picture of the interface where the driving force for a given reaction is not uniquely determined by the applied electrode potential. And that this driving force is basically proportional to the surface charge density. And indeed, if we were to re-examine the previous set of data as a function of surface charge density, then we indeed get a single valued function. What this also means then is that the energetics that we determine as a function of surface charge is also insensitive to the type of countercharge model that we apply, whether it's explicit charge, planar, Poisson Boltzmann, and so forth. And so, my suggestion in terms of calculating electrochemical barriers is that instead of calculating them as a function of work function, we look at them as a function of surface charge and we can relate them to functions of potential using known charging properties of the interface, such as the double layer capacitance, as well as the potential of zero charge. And this is the approach that we have taken in order to do a mechanistic analysis of CO2 reduction. Okay, and so I'll just talk very briefly about some latest results, um, first focusing on the importance of field effects. Okay, and so what makes CO2 reduction special relative to some other popular reactions is its sensitivity to the interfacial electric field. And so shown here is the adsorption energies for a number of important CO2 reduction intermediates as a function of electric field. Um, and essentially what we find is that the adsorbates that are most sensitive to the interfacial field are the ones with vertical CO bonds. Um, such as CO2, OCCO, and OCCHO. And this has an important impact on its mechanism, as well as how pH and ions affect their overall activity. And so as an example, we can look at CO2 reduction on gold. Um, and shown here is the result of a joint um, theoretical experimental study, um, where shown here is the experimental data, along with a whole bunch of other experimental studies um, for basically um, the current response to an applied voltage. And what we find in our um, kinetic model is that it is actually the CO2 adsorption step which generally limits the activity over the potential range that we are interested in. Um, and as a result, then, the Tafel slope for this reaction is proportional to the dipole of the CO2, which interacts with the electric field, as well as the double air charging capacitance. And the activity is affected by the field, which is proportional to the charge, which then is also affected by the charging properties, the double air capacitance, and the potential of zero charge as well. And what this suggests is that in addition to the energetics, we can also tune the double layer charging properties towards better activity. And this is exactly what ions do. Um, so it's been shown experimentally that CO2 reduction is highly sensitive to the cation composition, where between lithium and cesium in the electrolyte, there can be between one to three orders of magnitude difference in activity towards some of the products that we are interested in. And our hypothesis here is that it really is a size effect, whereby lithium with a larger hydrated radius than cesium can fit fewer ions at the interface at a given potential. And this really translates to a different surface charge for cesium as opposed to lithium at a fixed potential. And it is this difference in surface charge that gives the enhancement in activity that we see. And this is something that we can model quite easily um, by combining a continuum modified Poisson-Boltzmann model 
um, of the ion distribution with our ab initial reaction energetics computed as a function of surface charge. Um, and so shown here is the comparison between the theoretical prediction and the experimentally observed um, differences in activity, which are shown in dots and the theory is shown in lines. And so here, what we're showing here is the difference between lithium, sodium, and cesium and so forth for C2 products produced on copper. And here is the C production rates on silver um, as a function of different ions and we can see that the agreement is very reasonable and we can do the exact same analysis with the vibrational stark shifts as well at different um, electrolyte composition um, and again the agreement is very reasonable and what we can take away from this very simple analysis is, is that small hydrated cation radii and actually in principle large charges if they can be stabilized in solution are advantageous towards various interesting products in CO2 reduction. Um, and the last point I want to bring up is that in addition to tuning the double layer charging properties, um, we can also tune the activities um, through the adsorbate dipoles, and this can be done using single atom catalysts. Um, and so very recently, um, we've been very interested in iron nitrogen carbon catalysts simply because they have shown such promising geometric current densities when put into a gas diffusion electrode. Um, and these catalysts have the same mechanism as on gold for CO2 reduction to CO. Um, but what is special about them is that they are able to localize charge a little differently, such that they have different dipoles upon adsorption. And this is shown here in the transition state for CO2 adsorption as a function of surface charge density, where with different site motifs, we get different slopes, which reflect differences in their adsorbate dipole. Um, and when we're comparing then the simulated kinetics um, with experiments, what is suggested by our analysis then is that this new iron nitrogen carbon catalyst from Zile Hu's group, which has a very steep taffel slope, should correspond to a different active site. Um, and what this also suggests is that we can, in addition to binding energies, tune the adsorbate dipoles towards higher activity. Okay, and so with that, these are the main takeaways from this presentation. Number one, that we should be looking at surface charge density as opposed to the work function as the driving force for electrochemical processes. Um, and with this approach, we can um, um, basically understand new descriptors for CO2 reduction activities beyond binding energies. So the interfacial charging properties such as the PZZ and the double layer capacity and the ion size effect is really um, um, there through changing the um, double layer capacitance associated with a given um, interface. And in addition to that, um, it is possible that we tune adsorbate dipoles towards higher activity as well, for example, on single atom catalysts. Okay. Um, and so uh, that's it. Any questions? All right, thank you very much, Karen. Um, we've got time for a couple of quick questions. Um, one of them is about true driving force that you were showing in your slides and whether that should be the electrostatic potential of the ion as an adsorbate versus what it is in heat solution. Sorry, can you, can you repeat the question? I can't quite hear you. Sure. Um, so, Sorry. about the true driving force, and yes. so shouldn't the driving force be the electrostatic potential of the ion as an adsorbate versus in free solution? The I, um, I would say the true driving force is basically the potential difference between the metal and basically the potential at the reaction plane. So all I'm saying is that we shouldn't be looking at the bulk potential. We should be looking at the potential where the reaction occurs. Okay. And so whatever the electron would experience, yeah, where it is transferred. Got it. 
Um, another question is about in your formalism, would it be more appropriate to use the potential of zero total charge instead of the potential the point of zero charge? It would not be the potential of zero total charge because that would um, include the charge transfer due to adsorption. It would be the potential of zero free charge if it can be determined without the interference from adsorption. 